Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another uh, virtual event series. Um, I'm super happy you guys managed to join in, and I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, my name is Joyce. I'm the field marketing manager here for Foundry, and I'm here with my colleague Chris, um, associate product manager here at Foundry as well. So before we dive into um, Jan's session, I just wanted to share a couple of updates. We have 15 on-demand webinars now available. Um, you can check out these on foundry.com forward slash events. We have all the links available for all the on-demand sessions. For any questions, concerns, or if you want to participate in Foundry virtual events, you can send us an email on virtual.events at foundry.com. We have quite a packed list um, for the next couple of weeks for upcoming schedule. We have an innovation panel um, next week, so make sure you tune in. We have a mass screen projecting with Mari happening on June 11th, modeling for VFX today with Modo on June the 16th, and we've got new learnings with our very own Steve Wright as well on June the 18th. So make sure you check those out on our events page. So keep up to date with us uh, by following us on social media, um, as well as signing up to the Insights Hub and quarterly newsletter as well. Speaking of Insights Hub, so we have some really cool um, articles available now. So we've got five new ones that are available, so make sure you check those out. We've got some learning materials as well, and then we've got some videos on YouTube as well, Workflow Wednesdays, which go through some basic troubleshooting in Nuke 5 um, as well. I wanted to take the opportunity to say a massive shout out and thank you to our industry partners, Access VFX, ASWF, AS, ACM SIGGRAPH, and VES. So if you're not part of them already, make sure you're part of them. This is a very good opportunity for you to get to know people from the same industry, um, new jobs, and freelancing opportunities. So make sure you do sign up to these um, industry partnerships as well. Lastly, I wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you to all of our studios, clients, customers, freelancers, speakers, everyone who has initially made Fragile Virtual Events such a successful platform for us. So thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Um, and thank you for always bringing up new content for us as well. Um, and that's it for me. And I'm going to hand over to Chris. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Yeah, so as Joe said, uh, I'm Chris Webley, uh, Associate Product Manager on, one of the, on the Nuke team. So I just want to start by thanking everyone for joining today and you know coming here. We've got a really great speaker and a really great talk for you, so I'm excited for us to get to it. Before we do, though, I uh, just want to let people know that Foundry is hiring at the moment. So if you've ever had an interest in seeing what it's like to make the tools that you, know, you use for Nuke or for any of our, of our softwares, then do check out the website because there's some really great roles going. Another aspect is that, you know, with everything that's going on right now, there's people with a bit more time. If you can use some of that time to help us with the beta testing and see what's going on to the latest releases, that's really appreciated. Uh, the new teams managed to work really well for, remotely, um, but some things we do lack is some of the hardware we used to be able to test with. So if people have any hardware that can apply to things like you know high DPI or you know just uh, monitor out work, then that kind of stuff is super useful right now. Or if you're just interested to see what we've been working on, it's also great for people to apply and have a look. So yeah, definitely go check that out. And you know, really the important thing is though to first say a big thank you for Jan because he's the one going to be giving a great talk because I had the pleasure of introducing him at FMX last year on a similar talk called Discovering Compositing Magic Tricks in Nuke and it genuinely was really fascinating. So. I just really want to say, you know, stay safe and keep well during these interesting times. And I hope that you enjoy this talk as much as I know I will. So with that, Jan. Hi. So also for me, hi, and thank you for joining. And thanks to the Foundry for it's like an honor for me, deep in my heart, giving this talk to one of the coolest companies here on earth. So um, in my talk, like pulling a rabbit out of Newt Volume 2, it will be Again, something like about experimenting and playing with you. What I like is the easiness and simplicity of problem solving and how can we use to get creative solutions with new products? Like, um, what's there this magic and how can we improve this creativity? And furthermore, in my talk, I just want to go 
people like to enforce you not to see our VFX work, or our VFX work just in a loop of our shots or as an island. Welcome to. Welcome. To. Um, there are so much beautiful more crafts involved, and understanding will improve your compositing skills. Yeah, it sounds awesome. So I'm just going to jump in quickly to say, uh, for those who'd like to ask questions, because we will be doing Q&A at the end, on the right, you have a chat, but also a questions tab. If you can ask your questions there, that would help us out so much and just make it a lot easier to make sure that in the end, we can get to the stuff you're interested in knowing about. But yeah. Yeah. Come so let's go. On. Foundry virtual events. Welcome, Welcome to pulling the rabbit out of Nuke Volume Two. Well, thanks for joining all of you worldwide. Whether it's evening, morning, or just middle in the night. Today in this webinar, I want to talk about the joy of experimenting and using Nuke the creative way. My name is Jan Borda. I'm professionally working in VFX for more than 17 years. Thanks to Foundry and Nuke, I'm today more than happy that I can make a living out of doing colorful images and work in film business. I'm working at MechaVision's VFX department. MechaVision is part of Accenture Interactive. We are one of Germany's leading CGI players with a worldwide operating network. We have here in Stuttgart a beautiful work environment and a really experienced team. There are Emmy and VS winners among us and so much lovely people. A special thanks goes out to our art department for supplying me with beautiful artwork for this presentation. Thank you to Christian Leitner, Adam Wiesierski and Felix Flatt. And a thanks to Artbreeder I used to generate some nice AI-based images for this webinar. Nuke is something special, something magical, that gives me the possibility to draw my visions. What I love is starting a shot and to see it as a puzzle task or a riddle. I love these nice moments when build glück happens. These are the little happy accidents when something completely unplanned just materializes in front of your eyes. This process of creativity. What is creativity? It's being kissed by a muse. You really can't force an idea to form immediately. If you pressure on it, nothing might happen. It's suddenly there. You hear a word, you see an image, you smell, and it's there. First of all, how to get this inspiration. For me, there is this positive view of things. This makes it easier to approach the world openly. The stuff you focus on is the stuff you will receive. If your thoughts are about failing or succeeding, what do you think will happen in each case? What is Nuke for you? Some might say it's a 32-bit node-based compositing tool in true linear. Yeah, that's true, but it is a beautiful toy in a big child's hand too. The words you choose immediately change your attitude to the things. What is compositing to you? For me, compositing is like a dance. Last year, we were asked to make some telescope lens POV through a magical lens. The director just let us all the creative freedom. It was a child's movie and I remembered myself on these little colorful kaleidoscopes. Do you know? Actually, it was pretty easy to adopt this idea and <laughs> think the director loved it right away. We start with the map and this map we 
distort with the factor of one to six. We need uh, to do a texture map for us where we have this six times besides each other. I used a contact sheet and they are always mirroring each side. I used this as a texture on a sphere. I just made a sphere now um, six sided. This helps me for adjusting. The second sphere I just transformed to the side that it matches and the next one I keep on rotating it always in 60 degrees around the pivot just in the center. So with this I easily can, you see, just rotate it around and getting it back. So just adjusting them, getting all together. It's pretty hard now on my trackpad using Nuke on my MacBook. Okay, so here we have the kaleidoscope. And if we go back on our base texture and we start to move it a moment, update my screen, thank you. So we just start rotating it or scaling. You suddenly get this beautiful floral textures, you know, from a kaleidoscope. Ain't this beautiful? Okay, at this part you see it's a little bit edgy. You just need to make your sphere again like 30 sided so it. Now, you see it's looking quite nice. So, what I like is to bake my transforms, especially if they are sometimes very complicated. I just do an ST map and I just plug it in and go through all this texture, contact sheet, 3D sphere setup, use it as a ST map. And you see, I have it like here and I even can pre-render my ST map. You can use the solution if you have weird, undistort, redistort, move it here, move it there, and something breaks your concatenation. So bake your transforms using the ST map. To approach creativity, don't fix on a special way. Like, it has to be like this or that because it has always been like this. Keep, keep always space for your alternatives. We all know our nodes like the eye distort or the vector blur, but have you ever tried to use 10 eye distorts in a row, like a stacked nodes. So let's see what happens. So we start with this image and we just take a pretty standard noise texture where red and green has just a little bit different Z. We put it as a eye distort map and Actually, if you eye distort, you, you notice you suddenly, if you're going too far, you, you punch some holes into. But have you ever tried to do your eye distorts in a stack? Do some small eye distorts and put them 10 times, 15 times behind each other. It suddenly looks like it's smearing. And with this technique, you suddenly can start to experiment. Don't even eye distort your RGB, but even the, the distortion channel. Now it's getting bits lower and you get a different kind of look out of it. You get a very special look and you even can, can change the strength of your horizontal or vertical distortion by just um, color grading your red horizontal or green vertical distortion map. What you also can do is just get a roto paint in, put it as a mask like you multiply your map with it, just a slight of blur and if you now go get a brush you can start painting where your distortion is happening. Ah, oh, 
Come on, window, get away. You see? It's distorting down here. Okay, like this. Distortions are sometimes pretty heavy <laughs> to calculate. If you're at some point done, you can bake this hard distortions in an ST map like showed before and you save yourself quite a lot of render time. And if we now do this experimentation, we just key go back and we have our noise and let's do this with a vector blur. Oh, and the new vector blur, it's for me a bit complicated. If you press X and type in vector blur, you get this nice old fashioned vector blur. I love it. It's so you just have three or two points to point in. Okay, but going back, if you now put a slight vector blur and then you, you start putting like 10 vector blurs in a row, you get a pretty nice, nice image. Okay, now let's think, do a bump map. So we just blur our image slightly. We do a difference. Afterwards, we just push it up. And now we look through our stacked vector blur. Somehow it feels now a little bit from the look like, you know, this Google dream, uh, deep dream images. It looks quite fancy. Creativity arises from a lack or material shortage. It's about limiting oneself. This limitation keeps you up to improvise. You can do this fly through complete without CGFX, just using a noise, a sphere, and a divide merge. So let's take a look. If we want a PV of a smoke monster looking in front and flying through. Do a, do a sphere and push, uh, push a camera just in the middle of it. Do the camera very wide angled and use a normal noise as a texture going from up to down. Then it moves from the pole to the sides and just behind you. Okay, we have here a little texture problem. You can solve this with this old, uh, old times Photoshop, make a seamless texture. You just transform your noise by, by the factor of your image size, do a rectangular map and just mask it to the right side. So have here and as the noise is nicely uh, endless seamless you just have to texture what's happening on that side so doing it a little bit softer you see you lose your you lose your hard edge let's see this in motion it's working pretty nice you already feel some kind of smoke flying through us. So what's bothering me is this little stretchy texture in the middle. As we know, it's in the pole of the sphere, it's in the upper part of our texture. So we could multiply it down, but maybe it isn't the best part. So if you use the gamma, the gamma pins the zero and the one and bulges in between. So the dense parts of a smoke keeps their density longer than the more transparent parts and these lose their transparency much faster. So if you use a mask for the upper part and you then use your gamma down, you already see you may have a pin holder and then you just gamma down the whole texture. You see how the more transparent parts lose themselves faster. So this looks pretty promising. It's it already feels quite organic. 
<laughs> even with only a noise. If we are then up for maybe a bit more, let's say, creepy version of, of this hole, let's turn your noise into a turbulence. Do a soft mask and then divide them both. I really love this trick for some creeping noise texture around the ground. You see it suddenly feels like it's moving forward. And with this noise divide trick, you really get a beautiful organic feeling. Important to push creativity is no time pressure. You know that after a 10 hour shift, you possibly won't find a creative solution to your problem, even if you try to force it. Creativity might rise in times when you are bored and your brain just starts traveling. There are some beautiful structures hidden somewhere behind the noise. And it's only a few notes away. So let's see how to do this. If you get a noise and do very hard a road, so you put it on something like 80 and go on Gaussian, and afterwards you just go over with an emboss. Actually what you see is a first gray image, but here there's something nicely hidden. If you put your black point on something like 4.9, 4.95, you see there are some beautiful, uh, it looks almost like water or metal. So let's play an experiment with this trick. Just make your noise more horizontally stretched and distort maybe an image with it and then multiply your, your image with it to get a little bit of shading. So you get a quite interesting point of structures, quite out of nowhere, out of the noise. You can even get something like caustics looking like. If you go on your octaves in the noise on one, put in your emboss the emboss type to effect and the edge detector to simple, you find some pretty nice um, caustics looking style. If you now change your Z in your noise, it starts to move. Let's keep creative with, with this type. What can we do? Uh, actually, you can get beautiful structures out of it. You see, if I change the size of the emboss, it gets pretty uh, something like veins looking or like some neural structures. You can change your noise from turbulence to different sizes and you even can if you go with your noise like a vertical stretched you can get something like this could look like thunders or lightnings being creative is like recombining existing resources and forces the stuff you find it has always been there. It's nothing new, but it was just combined in a different way by you. Okay, so this is gonna be a pretty fast one. If you have a matte painting and want to get your sky moved, use this QX. Have your pivot along the horizon and by skewing the skies in front close to you moves much faster than the clouds near the horizon. A pretty approach to do volume rays is just get a roto and multiply it with some noise. Push the volume rays on. Okay, then you have a generated volume ray. Now with your noise, change the seed like with the Z or uh, your scale of the noise and you suddenly get this beautiful vol volume ray structures. You then uh, position it in your image just like a texture. Sometimes I use it on cards in 3D space and then you have a beautiful flight through th and you have them like really sitting in your scene. Ask yourself, 
What's there new to learn? Being curious is something elemental to creativity. Being open-minded for the new, so you just can make new cross-connections. A big learning point for me was to see behind the horizon of our VFX work. Not to see the shot only in a loop, but trying to understand all the other beautiful crafts that are needed to make a movie. Understanding the story behind your shot is just essential. If there's a script you are allowed to read, use this chance. It can be such a profit to understand the emotions and feelings of the writer. Understanding what your shot means to the whole story. Try to think like a DOP. When you have a locked camera, it might really help your shot moving it in post and having in mind what would a DOP do? Is your actor moving? Try to follow him with a lack of reaction time. Check the cut if all other shots are a handheld and the VFX shots suddenly are locked. It would feel like a magician always pointing for the tension when he's doing a trick. Like, why not grab a shot out of the cut and crack it? Like, then you even have the handwriting of the DOP doing his camera work. Check out for the cut of your sequence. It might give you a lot of information for solving your comp problems. Maybe there is an element you can reuse in your shot. Check your shot, not only in a loop, but in the real cut too. Does it suddenly feel completely different? Maybe your attention is going to different parts now. As editors like to cut into motion, think about this when adjusting your post camera move. So it continues the motion from the shot before a following. We sometimes tend into too much logical thinking. If you have a shot and the light and the BG plate is coming that way and this part is then in the shadow, if there would be an actor, the director or the OP might place an extra light to bright the action up. Or if the actor with a special makeup is hidden behind the smoke lingering in front of his face, maybe the director would ask to blow the smoke away on set just to see the $10,000 of special makeup. And last but not least, as I said in my last talk, directors love animals. So if you want to place some Easter eggs in your shot, some hidden animals <laughs> might do the trick. Love what you're doing. This is such a beautiful profession we are all up to. We, we are allowed to do films and this is beautiful. We are now in the end. Um, a big thanks for watching and a big thank you to the Foundry team for making this possible. And I really, really feel honored to make this talk. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jan, for, for that really fascinating talk. I absolutely love uh, approaching Nuke from the perspective of playing. I think a lot of the time we do these talks and we, we look at Nuke and it's really interesting to obviously understand how things work and how to go about creating really cool effects. But I think it does get missed a lot of the time how play can lead to a lot of real great creativity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Like that's that's the stuff I really like. Like playing around, being a child, and and have a, use it like a like a toy or enjoying doing it with fun. Hmm. Was that something you did from the get go with Nuke, or because I kind of feel like for a lot of new artists coming to Nuke, there's a, a you know there's always a learning curve when coming to these things. So even understanding just how you can use the eye distort node, how you can generate that really cool kaleidoscope example. Do you find that 
you had to first build a knowledge base with Nuke before you could start experimenting? Or did you just say, I'm just going to click knobs and change settings and just see what happens? No, I think like you really have to know the basics or it comes with the knowledge. Um, like last year, I said something like, first you have to know the rules, and then you can break them. So first, you have to know your basics, or not even the basics, but um, know them quite a good way. Like also Pablo Picasso, he was a um, super naturalistic uh, painter. And it was for me also like a feeling, as I started, the images did control me. And at some point in your career, it switches and you control the images. Yeah, no, I think that makes a really, really nice thing to touch on. I guess another thing that I'm interested to learn about, and like uh, for the questions, please do chuck questions in the chat, uh, yeah. in the question tab, and we will get to them. But for the moment, I'm going to steal you for a little bit. Um, but it seemed like with your approach, you were also talking and touching on you know thinking as an editor, thinking as a, a DOP. And I absolutely loved what you're saying about uh, reviewing your shot in the context of the edit so you can understand the flow and the impact your comp can actually have on it. Because we do get quite isolated as compositors and just looking at the single thing we're doing and making it yeah. perfect. And talking, touching on the feel, again, I think is a unique thing that I haven't heard many people push for. Is this something that you, again, started learning to later in your career when you started having more freedom to explore, more you know, control over what you're working on? Or was it something you were always a little bit mindful of? Uh, no, it just started just uh, during the career, just looking back, it would be like, well, I hope somebody would say this to me, like, as I, uh, as I was on already one year in, uh, in the business. So, um, actually, it's something that gets quite a lot missed. Like, if you see your shot always in the loop, the audience doesn't see it in the loop. It just see it flowing in the cut with all the sound effects with your attention not hold on the on your effect but on the story and suddenly maybe there is something like which calls your attention like i said before um think about all the vfx shots are locked camera and the rest of the film it's just a handheld then suddenly the audience will always feel something strange to this shot yeah, no, I mean, for actually experimenting then. So for yeah. someone, like, someone like myself who, who uses Nuke uh, quite a bit, but I haven't you know, I don't work shot on shots anymore. But when you start to think of, you know, your director makes a request for a certain effect, do you have in your mind already a toolbox of things you want to set up and play with? Or is it more of a case of, um, you know, taking that inspiration from life, from art, from um, you know, other references, and then just seeing how you can recreate that and you can extend that with the little additional touches you were doing. Yeah, just um, as how, how the show is. Like, we, we already had some shows where the director just said, um, I want this kind of effect, and you're up. To, uh, to any uh, creative solution. So you can do anything you would like. And that's that's the nice thing when you can start playing. Like um, it was Xavier Kola, um, director from the Swiss. He just said to us, you know, I am not gonna approve any shot of you because you are the professionals and you know when it's done. And on the, on the other show, like, the director he just gave us the plates and he said, I don't know, just play. And that's that's like nice having, getting this, um, or should I say like, that he's trusting us that much. Hmm. I mean, I have to say that's uh, an amazing thing to have, to have uh, people actually come in and allow you the freedom to, to create like that. I guess uh, for compositors working on, you know, the things where they're a lot more strict, I think it's still important to take kind of the message here of having a play yeah. and like just even doing that by yourself because it seems to lead to some really interesting and creative solutions. Uh, even just like how you were using the noise and the fractal to create almost vein-like things. I can easily see that being used for texture, just UV projects and things like that. 
or uh, that. And actually, like okay. there you go. Actually, like this um, flight through smoke. It was used for a German cinema movie. Like it was a smoke monster POV. The director asked for, and actually, like this kind of solution, it just did a trick. No, that's great. Well, I'm going to stop hugging you because we've got some interesting questions as well. So oh, yeah. let's jump over and have a look at the questions. I think there's a way for me to push them onto the screen. So, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, could we get a new script with the different types of examples used for noise and boss to create creative shapes? Cheers. Oh, sure. I, uh, I can send them to you. And uh, I think then. The best way would be like you from the Foundry, from Foundry team could publish them. Yeah, somewhere. I'll or have a chat with uh, with Joyce and we'll see how yeah. we we'll share them. But if uh, if Jan's willing to to set them up for us, then yeah, we'll definitely try and find. That's them. no problem. Great. Okay, so let's go to the next one from Lucas. Uh, how do you get some of those unusual node combinations? Are you sitting around sometimes and just add random nodes and see what results you get? So he had a similar um, thing as me. Actually, uh, actually not. Uh, it's not like I'm clicking here and just think what might happen. It was like with the um, with the noise and the wavy styles. I just remembered myself that. From some other part, if I do a really hard emboss, I gotta get like these beautiful structures that move into each other. And then it was okay, how can I extract it? Oh, okay, can you stand emboss? So it's like um, maybe like like a language. Like in, in my first talk, I combined new uh, compositing with language. It's like all these words are in front of you, and you just pull up a different sentence. So mm -hmm. it's it's already like maybe a little bit planned or a little bit okay. I have the solution or I have this goal I want to approve. How can I get there? Mm. Yeah, I mean actually that example reminded me of when we first introduced smart vectors into Nuke. Uh, mm -hmm. I was doing some experimentation and playing as well, and I had like a, a butterfly uh, wings flaps, and I was using the vectors to generate sort of a radial pattern outwards. And it was like yeah. just having seeing data for something other than what it's intentionally used for, and thinking about what does what can else can this be translated, and what else can this drive? I think is yeah, as you say, a good way to look at it as a different language. Yeah, or just try like with smart vectors. What happens if I animate the Z of the noise, put it in smart vectors, apply it to an image, just just try like it's like, okay, I've got this idea. Let's try it out. What what might happen? How many times actually, how many times do your ideas end up with something terrible? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot of times. Cool, cool. Well, most of the times. Yeah. And I don't want you presenting yourself as this amazing magician that just comes up with these things and they're perfect every time. I'm sure with experimentation you you, you learn from each one, don't you? Yeah, it's like a magicianing having this coin, and it just drops a thousand times. Awesome. Well, cheers for that question, Lucas. Uh, moving on to David. Uh, considering the enormous time pressure on productions, do you feel that the culture of having time to play with your tools should be more part of companies' work environments? Oh, it's it's a hard question. Like, there's always a lot of time pressure, but what I um, what I sometimes had is um, that if you just think uh, shortly about um, or play around, maybe not just work hard in one direction. Maybe you will find a solution that makes life easier. It's like something um, if you have to hurry, um, don't go fast. Like keep your pace. Also, or if you're under pressure, um, don't don't get this flow of adrenaline in your body. Don't get like uh, this, but keep calm and uh, just with this calmness, um, you tend to make less uh, less of mistakes. Get to your solution maybe faster. And sometimes it's like only a road. This experimentation it just takes maybe a minute or two. So. Um, 
I think uh, just try on your way. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we've got a similar question from, uh, I'm going to say yeah, pronounce Ale. Uh, but how do you have the time and heart to be creative after a hard day at work? When is the best time to experiment? I mean, just quickly for me on this, because this is something that I've uh, also struggled with, like wanting to have that creative outlet when you're doing other things. I think you have to figure out when in the day is when you feel like you have the creative peak and then intentionally make a little bit of time for yourself then uh, would be yeah. how I would approach that. Or something like maybe not directly uh, directly like sitting in front of you sometimes uh, like in the midday break like in my uh, my one hour day break i just go to a museum here somewhere nearby and just take a look on art or uh, i do some sports sometimes it just help me going out for for a run and then it's like if you don't focus your brain all the time on, I have to find a solution, I have to find, if your brain suddenly gets bored, if you're doing maybe sports or go dancing, then it's suddenly there, like the idea, you, uh, you suddenly, wow, okay, I could do it this way. And then on the next day, you can just, just try. But I wouldn't say I never or mostly never had uh, a good uh, creative solution after 10 hours shift or eight hours like going to the evening the creativity just drops yeah i think for me you'll you you you'll figure out when in the day you're most creative and giving yourself time will only enhance you as an artist because while obviously you have so much commitments to getting it, it done in a day and, and we've all we all know that crunch and how nasty it can be but the habit of building, giving yourself a little bit of time, you'll figure out how to build your day around that, and then you'll keep yes. it both. And actually, your answer, I think, led really well into this next question. Um, oh, okay. Uh, what advice would you give to an artist to break a creative block that he or she could be facing when tackling a shot? Um, for me, it's just helping doing sports, doing something like... Um, if we, uh, if we are just sitting all the time in front of the computer, um, doing something different, like not working with your eyes, with your brain, but maybe just with your body, like maybe go to a gym uh, in your midday break, just maybe before, before working, go maybe for a swim uh, just before working, uh, maybe go, go dancing, um, like this is something that helps for me, uh, doing something something different. Yeah, I think different is the key because even if you don't have time or the space, say you know it's last minute and you just need to focus on that. I think what Kian was saying about keeping a steady pace was really important. But giving yourself the time to step away, even for half an hour to an hour, to say. I'm not going to focus on this shot. Maybe I'll pick up another shot or help someone else with another shot. Then your brain's focusing on that, but in the subconscious, it's, it's still yeah. working away. Um, and also what I try to do, like, for me, is also the, the kind of time management. If I know my shot is due by today, I try to push myself, my internal deadline, maybe just a bit earlier, because there's always some loops you have to go. And also not to do my um, my date for just at a point where I just want to leave the office, because after me there are still the producer, the coordinators who have to pack uh, the shots to give it to the client, and they want also to get get home maybe to their families, to their friends. So also being respective to 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 the other crafts here in your VFX company that um, to push yourself to this, uh, to this time. Mm. Or I, know, to this time. I noticed that the environment you're in already seems to be quite a good place to stimulate creativity. Do you find that actually creating an environment which has artwork or has things that allow you to separate yourself a bit from the immediate work, is that helpful to you? Or do you think for that's helpful? Uh, for me, it's very helpful. Like. Uh, <laughs> having a lot of toys, a lot of artwork and stuff like uh, like that just around me. It just helps me uh, um, 
like one of my most favorite toys. I just found it in Berlin. It's like this one. I don't know if it might work. Uh, ah, oh here. <laughs> it's like a beautiful old style kaleidoscope. And actually, this was well, this one just in front of my desk. This gave me the idea for the for the director. Nice. Oh, we've already got a live example right there. Well, fantastic question. Thank you for that. Um, ben, uh, seeing the possibility of what Jan creates in Nuke, or oh, Jan, sorry, uh, what yeah. are the chances of the Foundry creating a node based photo editor? Oh. Uh, interesting question. Um, I think, you know, the more we see people experimenting, it's more based on how we like to, you know, solve problems. We like to see what parts of, you know, what parts can we contribute to help improve your workflows to give you new workflows? I definitely think uh, photo editing is a really interesting part. I don't know how much we would want to, at the moment, dedicate time towards that when there's a lot of other problems we feel like can be solved in the industry and can really help uh, artists in a wide spectrum. But we're always open to it. So I think it's it's always interesting when the best way to get this feedback for us is to raise it in things like that. Or if you have the time, I know it's difficult when you're working, uh, but feature requests, uh, they do help us, you know, we go into them, we have a look through and we have a think, well, how can we think on this in terms of what impact we can contribute to the industry to make something that isn't already out there or to, to give you tools that can help you solve new problems. But yeah, really, really interesting thing to raise. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm a cinema student in France. Any advice to enter the VFX world and work in cinema? Hmm. Like any advice? It's for me. It's like um, the one is learn, learn new. Just get into a maybe a, into a company with an internship, like. Um, all the internships I know just after a few months normally they just got to a junior and then just walked up and there are so many interns I know that are maybe now lead compositors come supervisors just start with that and the other advice is train your eyes like nuke is your tool is your toy but what what makes you special it's your eyes like seeing different colors, having a taste for for weight in an image. Play, um, just uh, learn something about photography do, um, and doing a lot of photography. So then you learn about lenses, you learn about what kind of sensor, uh, how it works, about motion blur and stuff like that. So um, it's like, Keeping you up creative. If you go into a museum, you uh, you just get inspired by other great artists. Mm, definitely. So I'm just looking at the time. So we've got some really good questions. So I'm going to focus start focusing on the questions, which oh, is yeah. to do with the talk. For any that I don't answer uh, or we don't cover live, I'll try to type an answer in chat at the end. Okay. Uh, just as a heads up for those in the chat. But do please keep asking questions. Uh, yeah, please keep up. So do you have a favorite shot where you, uh, a favorite shot, especially where you used uh, your techniques? Um, like, uh, like a shot just uh, up in my career? Um, it's hard to say there are like, uh, it's hard to say if I have a favorite shot Every shot is something something special, and for me, it's I I really like the time I'm working on a shot. I'm working with the team, like we are working maybe on a show for for six months, and the experience being with the team, having a great time, it's something that's at least so so important, so beautiful for me. Like as the shot. It, Itself. And if I have a favorite shot, I don't think so. I don't, don't think I have a favorite shot. I pick your favorite child. <laughs> if, uh, if I will uh, remember, I, I will write to the Foundry team and Chris will answer you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's jump across. So, 
Do you have a wish for some special new node in Newt to be able to support your playing with Newt, like new noise types, uh, loops, as was suggested in the chat earlier, actually, which is a really good suggestion? So is there anything that you're, you feel like would help enhance your experimentation? Um, not till now. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't uh, never thought about um, getting some new nodes. Um, just what would be for me, it's always more faster, more, uh, more faster and more stable. That's for me like, uh, and, and even now it's really stable and, and fast, but that's like stuff I would always, always wish for. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, ooh, someone's uh, trying to get you to do work uh, after this. They uh, definitely want you back. So, would you consider showing some tricks about deep compositing in Volume Three? Oh, I haven't worked that much with deep compositing. Um, I think like my tricks in deep compositing would end up in like maybe a few minutes. Um, but I can just uh, keep 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 this in mind and. Uh, will place it, yes? Well, if you do come up with any uh, interesting decompositing tricks, uh, I think Joyce at the beginning of the talk uh, mentioned about our, our newsletter and our workflow Wednesdays and tips and tricks. So we often put little things like that in, in there mm -hmm. if uh, it doesn't fit yeah. the whole webinar. So we definitely, like, even if you find something small, we'll definitely still Yeah, I, I can. Like the, the most deep compositing tricks would be about uh, getting, uh, getting a faster work, but uh, I think there are much more greater geniuses maybe in this chat or uh, out there in the in industry what deep compositing is, <laughs> is about. <laughs> this is definitely a, an interesting topic. Yeah. For those, for those uh, listening who maybe haven't uh, explored deep compositing before, there's uh, a talk on the Foundry channel, um, mm -hmm. which is an introduction to deep compositing that I did uh, a few SIGGRAPHs ago, which I think is a good launching platform. I also know that Hugo Guerra recently did a uh, uh, deep compositing one, which is really great to listen to. So some some really good resources out there if people are interested in learning. And then hopefully that when uh, Jan's ready to do the volume three, uh, you can utilize that knowledge. Uh, well, this one's just a really nice uh, comment from JR, but it disappeared because apparently I answered it. But essentially, great work. Do you use pre-renders to build your comps? Oh, always. Like uh, my comps tend to be the most part uh, just out of pre-renderers. Um, like in my first talk, I said something, the stuff that divides a junior maybe from a senior compositor might be the iterations he needs for his comp. Like the junior maybe needs 100 iterations to finish a comp. The senior with his experience needs maybe 10 iterations. Like if the senior then would need the iteration, like when your scan line drops, if that would be 10 seconds and the junior maybe build up it with only one second, then they might get into the same pace. So um, I, it's almost everything I do, it's based on pre-renderers and if the part, the part I'm actually working and losing the pre-render, working in it, and then just plug it back and re-render it again. And just a tip what I am really like to do, the first frames I maybe tend to have my key frames or my special interest frames like frame 1001, 1050, 1100 in the last frame. I pre-render them locally, just throw it on the render farm, and then I work only on these few, few frames. And I know like maybe even if the render farm is full and it needs a long time, I know I already can work on this pre-render fastness power. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's actually one of the first pieces of advice I got uh, back when I was doing lighting work to begin with in my career. Mm -hmm. was like, don't, don't try and work on the entire sequence. Take the yes. key parts of the, of the shot and then that will stand you a good stead. And then once you build things out, you can then start looking at the yeah. things. No, that's a really good point. Uh, so we've got nearly five minutes. So uh, okay. again, a lot of really good questions. So I'm going to sort of uh, see if I can pass. Jump, jump and pick some ones. Uh, although this one from Johannes is, is any tips regarding how to communicate best with the various other departments, like DOP director or else working on a film, 
how do you make them listen? Um, that's, that's a good question. How do you make them listen? Um, I think a very important part is listening to them. It's listening and maybe directly listening what the director wants to say. Sometimes uh, it was uh, when the director just described the feelings of the shot or of the sequence, you just could get closer to what, what he wants. And um, for me, it was always listening, listening, and maybe asking. Um, it's, um, that's something like to try to, to get what, what they want, what, what they are searching. It's always hard to put from this one part images, put your feelings into the part words, then you transform the words to the other one, and he just makes an image. So the best experience was maybe working even just together. Mm -hmm. So taking the director's deal piece as a part, um, as a part so they, they, they have the feelings they can manage it or they see suddenly where the problems might, might be. Yeah, I think that's really good. And I think it's a good point in terms of even though we're all driving towards the same end goal and product, often we can yeah. feel tribal in the fact that, you know, we're, we're the compositing department or, you know, this is this department or that's, you know, they're not from inside the company. Uh, and it's better if you just start from that collective mindset of we're all working towards the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, really interesting. Not, not just saying to the director, it's not working, but trying to feel what, what how, how could I achieve what he what he's looking for? We've got more more praise. Uh, how about making Color Rabbit a monthly event? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I feel like we. Oh, uh, that, but I think Jan, his uh, his supervisors in Macavision would not like us stealing him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but really, really lovely comment. Yeah, that's that's a really nice compliment uh, I would love to I just have to take a look where where I would find some time for mm. but uh, at least I would be really happy for maybe next year for an invitation <laughs> definitely definitely mate. Um, well we've already got so many people suggesting some really good uh, ideas like I, I can't go for all these but we've got yeah. some uh, belt suggesting what is a 5d projection technique in uh, volume three um, <laughs> Someone asking if you still play surprise animals in your comp to clearly... Oh, sometimes yes. Sometimes yes, and so, uh, like even then in the shows, maybe when you just can pull the attention of the director just just to this animal and he's super happy. So I'm always like uh, placing uh, some, some surprise animals uh, for the directors. Nice. This is going to be our last question, unfortunately, because we will have to wrap up. Uh, I just saw a question just before if you're if I'm a creative or mathematical compositor. I'm just more a creative compositor, like my mathematics just and maybe after multiply, add, minus, and divide. <laughs> nice. Well, it's, it's great to see the stuff you create, though. Thank um, you. So last question. Uh, did slash do you have a mentor? I know you have been a mentor to other artists in the past. If so, what would you say you have learned from him or her? Um, who would be my mentor? Like from uh, from supervision, it would be um, also my supervisor here at Macavision, Yuri Stanose. I learned a lot of um, maybe also transporting see or how do you achieve the feelings of the director how to maybe this communication with the director how to um, how to work um, effectively on a shot and like in uh, compositing I would see, say my mentor or someone I really admire is Klaus Wuchter he's a compositor and I learned from him also uh, this Keep your keep your work or your solution easy. Try to work fast. Try uh, to avoid long render times and think about um, a creative solution. Like 
he uh, he had in one show a shot where the camera just went up uh, and you just saw the, the studio light just burning through the hair of the actor. And actually the scene should be always cloudy, misty. And he just placed an open sky, just little place where the sun is hitting through the sky just to, to get his brightness so he didn't have to uh, fix, do a lot of roto paint. So I really, uh, seeing this, it was, wow, cool. Yeah, no, this all sounds like good advice to have learned. So with that, we come to the end of uh, this webinar. Thank you so much, Jan. It was uh, really, really great to, to see your experimentation again and to see some really interesting uh, workflows. I also really appreciated the talk, almost felt Bob Ross-esque in how calming it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for all of you worldwide staying here and listening. Yeah, and uh, yeah, to everyone in the chat who joined, thank you so much for, for taking part, for the questions, for just being here. And, you know, please do stay safe and healthy uh, during these times. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we stay yeah, we look forward stay to seeing you. And playful. And playful. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Great. Well, thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.